Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you so much for being here. I'm Christine Mallinson. I'm the director of the Center for Social Science Scholarship. And in honor of Earth Day tomorrow, we are hosting today's event, which is called Trees as Climate Solutions, a Roundtable Debate. So um, just a couple housekeeping issues um, before we begin. For those of you who are joining us via Zoom, um, if you can just keep yourselves muted so that we can hear our panelists, uh, that would be great. Um, and then following their discussion, we'll have a little bit of time for Q&A, and at that point, we'll open things up to the audience. You can also chat me at any point with any questions that you might have that you might want me to hang on to and post to our panelists um, on your behalf during the Q&A. And for folks who are joining via Facebook Live, um, you can also type any questions that you have as comments and then um, we'll be able to share those with our panelists too. And then, um, like I said, we're recording today's event and then after the event, we will upload it to our website, which is socialscience.umbc.edu. Um, so you'll be able to access it after the fact and share it with anybody who might have missed it. Um, okay, so onto the format of our event. We've got um, five fantastic panelists joining us today. Let me just make sure really quickly that our live stream is working here before, um, before I do. I don't see it. It looks like it might be taking a minute to pull up. Oops, hang on one second here. Okay, let me try this one more time for the live stream so that we don't lose anybody there. And then I will introduce our panelists. Okay. Let's try that again. All right, so thanks, sorry for sorry about that. We have five fantastic panelists joining us today. I'll just introduce them really briefly. We've got Dr. Earl Ellis, professor in the Department of Geography and Environmental Systems. We also have Dr. Matthew Fagan, assistant professor in Department of Geography and Environmental Systems. We have Dr. Susan Sterrett, who is professor and director in the School of Public Policy. And we have Dr. Fernando Tormosa Ponte, postdoctoral fellow in the School of Public Policy and in the Department of Political Science, and Dr. Blake Francis, who is a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Philosophy. So thank you to each of our panelists for joining us. And I'll go ahead and turn things over to uh, Dr. Earl Ellis to go ahead and introduce the debate topic and then kick off our roundtable. So thanks. All right. Thank you, Christine, for, for managing this. Uh, and I, I can say that this, this whole thing originated uh, from this op-ed that I wrote, uh, but in this case, this is initiated from immediate reactions that came up in the department through email chains when sharing this op-ed. So it, it's clear that uh, it's attracted a lot of, of attention. Uh, and I, I, I think that's exactly what it was intended to do, like all op-eds, it's tr calling attention to uh, a particular way of looking at a, at a problem that's been facing me as, through my whole career. Uh, and I, I can say that the, the fact that we haven't solved global climate change is one of the most distressing and uh, depressing elements of being an environmental scientist uh, for over the last 30 years. And one of the simplest questions that I'm always trying to ask and, and find answers to is why aren't we solving these problems? And when it comes down to it, the problem of global climate change is rather simple. It's caused by the buildup of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, primarily carbon dioxide, caused by emissions of fossil fuels, uh, from, from burning fossil fuels. Um, it's true that a certain amount of the climate change that we've had over the last few thousand years has been caused by deforestation and tillage of soils, but this is actually not the reason why our atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations are accelerating out of control. Um, I'm 100% for trees. Okay, I love trees. Zero de net deforestation is a great objective, great target. I'm all for tree planting in the right places in the right times, but this will not solve global climate change. It's at best a very short-term stopgap that will slow things down a little bit, and that would be no problem, except that it's become the major focus of uh, the corporations and political leaders aiming to divert attention away from the real cause of global climate change, which is carbon emissions from fossil fuels. Um, and as long as that's going to go on, and I, I think it's one of the reasons why there's been success in diverting attention away from the primary cause, which is combustion of fossil fuels, 
uh, to other potential things that could solve some little part of the problem. Um, and I'll, I'll give you the example before I, I end up. The example that bothers me the most is when I ask students in my intro uh, science courses, my intro environmental science courses, so what can you do to solve global climate change? And you know, without any background, the first thing a lot of people say is recycling. That's just one example, planting a tree in my yard. Okay, this will not solve global climate change. And the reason that people think this is not just because of politicians trying to diffuse responsibility or corporations trying to diffuse responsibility. It's a general form in some ways of misinformation by expanding the scope of this problem to include trees uh, rather than focusing on the burning of fossil fuels and the need for a transition to clean energy systems that are affordable. Uh, we've got a problem that's going to be very hard to solve. The pressure has to be kept on fossil fuels. All right, that's, that's my little bit. Great, so we'll go ahead to um, Matt Fagan for the, for the next um, segment. Great, so first off, I, I loved Earl's article. I thought it raised a bunch of important points and I'd just like to stipulate those at the beginning. Uh, Focusing on trees is the big solution, the big solution, underlining the, does take a w em attention away from emitters. It, trees can't do it all alone. They're only 20% of emissions if you look at land use change. Uh, the focus needs to be on clean energy. Um, but kind of the big highlighted message in this is that trees are a dangerous diversion. And I think that none of that those supporting arguments are wrong, but that final conclusion is just not right. And to kind of tell you why I think that, let me, make another argument, kind of expand the argument a little bit. Um, focusing on energy efficient housing as the big solution to climate change is a dangerous diversion. It takes attention away from emitters. It, you can't do it all alone. It's only 12% of emissions. And folks needs to be on clean energy, right? Forget that it's cheap to do. Forget that it generates jobs, it helps the poor, improves air quality. Forget that it has bipartisan support. It can show results, visible results that can help build momentum toward a bipartisan solution for climate change, right? The same arguments I just gave you also apply to reforestation. Any one solution to climate change isn't gonna solve it clearly, right? We need a kitchen table approach and all the above. How does a mouse eat a whale? Bite by bite, bite. Academics have say this as wedges to solve climate change. Tree planting and the focus on trees is just one wedge, right? It's inappropriate to think of it as the only wedge. I think Earl's point is very well taken, but attacking the first bipartisan solution to climate change um, is dangerously counterproductive, right? Imagine you're fighting with your neighbor about a fence and you're, he wants to build a fence, you don't want to build a fence, you're arguing, right? And the neighbor makes an offer that maybe we'll just draw where the fence should be and put down some lines and holds out their hand and says, here's an idea we can both agree on. And what do you do? Do you push, you slap the hand away and demand the whole fence now because you want to build a fence? Or do you shake the hand starting small and using that opening to show progress and push for more, right? Climate absolutism is a real barrier to progress. We can't have a dangerous aversion from a non-existent bipartisan plan. US climate change policy just whiplashes every four to eight years. Um, it's time we started saying yes and and started pushing for more rather than no, right, to the other side, because climate change doesn't care about sides. Um, just to recap my argument, reforestation is one of many solutions. Um, it has many side benefits, and it's not kind of unfairly attacked, because it's just been brought up as the first thing people can agree on, that and efficiency, right? Um, and it's time to encourage any action to build bipartisan solutions. Um, today, it's tree planting and energy efficiency. Tomorrow, given the growth of the industry in Texas and the Great Plains states, it could be solar power and wind. Um, and I think the more that we can not quibble on methods um, and refuse to even start building this wall, right? We shouldn't be surprised if nothing gets done on climate change in the next decade, because we need to start small where we can agree. And I totally agree with all the supporting arguments Earl just raised. Just the final conclusion, right? It's the wrong one. It's not a dangerous diversion, it's a start. Great, thank you so much. So we're um, gonna go next to Fernando Tormosa Ponte. Thank you, Christine, and thank you everyone for uh, being in attendance during these times. So 
I, I really like the, the op-ed and I like the position that it takes. Um, I like that. Uh, I like previous op-eds that said that we need to articulate values and think about how we can articulate and enact a fair approach to addressing climate change. Um, so a few things that I'd like to raise in, with respect to the op-ed and then move on to a few other things that I'd like to add. Uh, I agree that uh, pollution is one of the main problems. I will say though that trees are tied to carbon pollution, right? The, the ways in which uh, we mine is intimately uh, tied with uh, deforestation, right? We know this is a huge problem in the Amazon, for instance. Um, also, it's important to continue to think about uh, one of the things that the article mentions, which is, of course, even more relevant now during the time of COVID, is that cheap energy, yes, it may be a social good, but energy dependence itself puts lives at risk, uh, particularly during times of disasters. Uh, we've seen this after uh, big hurricanes uh, and, and coastal regions. Uh, we've seen this in areas like Michigan when they lost power during a major snowstorm, uh, right? So uh, we need to think about infrastructure change as well, decentralizing energy consumption and operating energy utilities in inclusive and transparent ways that show how we are distributing this power in equitable ways. And of course, a problem with respect to that is the privatization of utilities. Uh, also, particularly in times of disasters, right? So one thing that I'd like to raise, I think the main point I, I like to raise is that, uh, yes, I agree that trees are part of the solution. I agree that carbon pollution is the main problem, but uh, what is missing here is agency. Governments and corporations will not seed without demand just to borrow from the words of Frederick Douglass, uh, they were, particularly when fossil fuel is, is inexpensive, it's, it's particularly during this time of COVID, and given the vast investments that we've made as a society in fossil fuel extraction and dependence, right? So given, if we all agree that these governments and corporations will not seed without demand, then we should also focus on movement building we should focus as well on listening to folks that have been fighting climate change on the ground, right? And building a people-oriented approach to addressing climate change, building people power. By virtue of doing that, we can avoid mining, we can avoid extraction because these things don't happen in a different planet. They happen in communities and these communities are organizing. This is a tradition of environmental justice and climate justice. And these movements have pointed to fair, inclusive, and democratic ways in which we can organize to stop these extractive practices that will both save trees as well as avoid uh, pollution. They are calling to keep fossil fuels on the ground. Another thing I want to mention, and I'll, I'll, I'll start closing here, is we need to avoid this predominant focus on the national level of governance. It is huge, it is important. The United States at the federal level must take action. But like Eleanor Ostrom said, there is a world of possibilities for action above and below the state level. We need to think about ways in which we can enact change that addresses climate change at the state and local level as well as the international level. And we have a lot of entrepreneurs, uh, people entrepreneurs who are taking steps uh, to do so. So thinking about how we develop polycentric approaches with multiple centers of action to addressing climate change will be really important. And we also need to develop polycentric social movements that mirror these institutions and that can exert pressure on these levels of governance simultaneously and coordinating across these different instances of governance. I will end by bringing us to the current uh, crisis, the COVID pandemic. It is certainly a huge window of opportunity for both those who want to address climate change as well as those who do not. So we need to think about how do we transition organizing efforts during these times, the challenges of doing so, and what our role as folks in the academic community is as part of this community of folks who are interested in addressing the issue of climate change. So I will end it there. Thank you.
Thank you so much. Okay, next up is uh, Dr. Susan Sterrett. Thank you, Christine, and thank you so much uh, for including me in this extremely interesting and valuable conversation. And to everybody for showing up and all of us getting used to talking to each other on these flat screens, which is not as engaging as real life. Um, I want to pick up on it, and I also really enjoyed um, uh, Professor Ellis's editorial. I really enjoyed thinking about trees, and I've benefited quite a bit from recent conversations about thinking about complexity and the kinds of benefits we can have. I want to pick up on um, and uh, ways of addressing problems that we can have. Um, I want to pick up on what Professor Fagan mentioned around the side benefits and multiplicity in efforts. It's also picking up on, um, on uh, Professor Tormos Aponte's um, point about fair and equitable ways of addressing issues and multiplicities in having polycentric um, ways of addressing things. I imagine that we would like to avoid um, what, what sometimes in, in public policy gets called solutionism, um, the kind of hand waving from centralized corporations that say, if you just do this, the problem is gone. Instead, um, we want to think about uh, actions that might have side benefits. Trees certainly have side benefits um, in terms of enhancing urban environments, um, but we also want to make sure that we, uh, on the point about agency and fair and equitable um, uh, efforts, we want to make sure that we have local consultations, is at least part of the time, more useful to have, um, to have uh, grasslands that uh, do a better job of acting as carbon sinks. How are we going to know that? Partly by being in conversation, which is what I've been doing with my a uh, newly at home environmental sciences graduating senior recently, and that also um, uh, uh, means that we need to make sure that there is local commitment and buy in for programs. That picks up Dr. Tormos Aponte's um, point about fair and equitable solutions. We need people who feel connected, and that also often means starting small. In Patterson Park, like Dr. Tormos Aponte, I live very close to it. If you're ever out on weekday mornings before this international catastrophe, I don't know why we call it a situation, like let's be clear what this is, um, you would see the local Audubon Society out with children from the local schools loaning them binoculars to get connected to the birds. Why? Certainly because they love birds, but if you pay attention to Audubon at all, they want to build a constituency around climate change. Uh, college movements, certainly around divestment, around um, uh, carbon, but not only around carbon, things that can give people hope. Um, so whether that's planting grasslands, people do better with hope and hope comes from practical actions. And again, there's a lot of social science evidence around this. I am trying to speak from public policy. So the local actions, whether it's feeling emotionally connected to the birds in Patterson Park and being aware that it's in your backyard, learning how to care for wetlands and feeling like there's something that you can do. Um, recognizing that climate change is here. It's not only about stopping um, carbon emissions, though God knows it's about that, but uh, all the geoscientists recognize that the recent disasters are climate related. That means fair and equitable housing solutions here and now are part of climate change. And again, that, that can give a sense of agency that Dr. Tormos Aponte was talking about and the local um, buy-in and clearly seeing benefits and some of the side benefits that um, Professor Fagan was talking about as well. So for example, post Hurricane Harvey, there is a large class action lawsuit, and I'll stop here, around all the benefits going to homeowners rather than renters, um, because that's how FEMA organizes its benefits and HUD does as well as the short story. So finding ways um, to develop that sense of agency, which often means a close emotional connection. Um, it means developing multiple ways of addressing a problem. And it means drawing on multiple kinds of expertise to find out the ways locally people can make steps. Do we need to stop carbon emissions? Absolutely. Do we need to build movements? Of course we do. And that means that we need to pay attention to the side benefits we get from taking action now. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Okay, great. So we'll turn now to our last panelist, Dr. Blake Francis in philosophy. Great, thanks. And uh, thanks for having me. This has been uh, 
a great discussion so far and uh in the in the current uh uh catastrophe uh very engaging um uh despite not being in person very engaging especially against the background of the sort of everyday boredom that <laughs> this pandemic waging on is uh is uh causing in my own life where uh, i'm delighted to be here so as a philosopher i do the i do most of my work on the ethics of climate change and um i was thinking about ways in which i could contribute to this discussion um, and instead of actually giving an argument for sort of climate solutions i thought what i would do is introduce some sort of concepts that can help diagnose uh, what exactly is going on here uh, in the um, planting trees to save the world argument. And I, I really liked the clarity of the New York Times article written by Professor Ellis and his colleagues. And I wanted to sort of provide a little uh, sort of philosophical um, girding, um, you know, um, that might help us uh, in, in having the conversation um, going forward. So I wanted to introduce this idea of moral corruption. And most people are familiar with corruption in, in, in social life, uh, like when public figures take bribes and things like that, rather than doing their duty. Um, similarly, moral corruption has to do with uh, sort of taking positively favored moral points of view like doing good to one's neighbor or something like that and turning it to one's own interests. And often with cases of moral corruption, it's done in ways that are very, very subtle, especially in social life. And it's very, very prevalent in all over the place in negotiations around climate change. And in fact, even just the very way that we often talk about climate change reeks of moral corruption. Like, this idea, and, and now side benefits have been mentioned a lot, and I want to sort of put that aside, but just in public discussion, the idea that we need a win-win solution to do something about climate change, it can be diagnosed as having a kind of moral corruption. And let me explain a little bit, um, maybe using the trees example, but about what I mean. Planting trees is a great thing, uh, and the there's a positive moral feeling that comes with planting trees. And I think that um, bringing the planting trees argument into the climate change debate is a way of sort of co-opting that positive moral feeling <laughs> and that positive moral judgment that we ought to plant trees to serve a particular interest. And, uh, and I think that's one of the things that's implied by Alice's argument is that the planting trees argument is being co-opted to serve the interests of the big fossil fuel industries and that sort of thing. And um, another way that, uh, you know, the, the um, moral corruption plays out is that doing feel good things or making feel good arguments about planting trees is also an easy way to downplay people's obligations. And we've actually seen this in actual climate policy, where in the past the United States has claimed that because they have a mildly successful forestry program that grows lots of second growth forests, they should have less obligations to reduce their emissions. Um, and so in this situation of moral corruption, there's a real difficult question about how we should go about engaging in public debates. So just to take on the sort of win-win sort of side benefit policy example, how, given the fact that there is a real and important argument to be made for planting trees as part of the solution to climate change, and a real important argument to be made for in, in, in bringing in as many wedges as we possibly can to the service of solving the climate change problem, how do we in our public fora engage in debates with people who are using tactics that are morally corrupt um, to sort of figure out what the real solutions are? And if there's one way that I took issue with the article, it's that in, 
in engaging with the moral corruption, it may also have gone a, a little bit too much in the extreme direction, um, as many of you have commented, that it might be too extreme to say that you know, what we need right now is uh, to focus explicitly, uh, exclusively, excuse me, on reducing fossil fuels when, like many people have suggested, more multi-pronged approach might be called for. But I just want to sort of um, sort of flag that the conversation, I think a lot of the work that people are doing, who are people who are on the panel are doing, is being done in the context of moral corruption. And that's a very, very difficult context to work within in terms of trying to achieve uh, achieve real solutions. So that's that's all I have. Uh, and uh, thanks again. Fantastic. Okay, so I'm going to suggest that all of our panelists unmute yourselves um, and, and hopefully that will work okay without feedback um, or, or any audio issues. Um, and then hopefully you all can sort of engage a little bit in discussion about the points that you've raised. Do you mind if I respond to a few things that, that came up? Uh, and it was, it was, the order was in some ways perfect because uh, and I, I'd, I'd prefer to work back, backwards from, uh, from Blake's uh, comments. And that was wonderful, though. The, I want to know more about moral corruption as a, a subject. If you have any uh, papers on that, please send that along. Because I, that, yeah, you, you framed exactly what I think has happened uh, to the climate change arena, uh, is that it's fraught with this. And even the best intentions of people who want to plant trees, like me, I want to plant trees, or uh, conserve wild forests or whatever, are being co-opted for the purposes of uh, avoiding dealing the hard work of transforming the societal energy system, which is the only thing, the only thing that will stop the climate crisis. Everything else is just a slow down tactic. The only thing that will ultimately stop it is ending the combustion of fossil fuels. Uh, but anyway, uh, the, the one thing you highlighted there that was brought up, I think, by, by Matt's point, too, uh, about kind of throwing out the baby with the bathwater in this kind of multi-pronged approach you mentioned this idea that it, the article was too extreme. And, and I, I just like to address, I mean, maybe it is. Uh, and I, I do agree that it's always nice to have another reason to plant trees. Uh, but here's again, my, let me just refocus again on what I see as the issue here. The only thing that will solve climate change is ending the combustion of fossil fuels. Okay, insulating your house better will not end it. It might slow it down, it might make energy systems more efficient, but if the energy system is still burning fossil fuels, it doesn't matter. In the long term, it doesn't matter. The only, the real problem here is the need to transition off of fossil fuels somehow. Um, and, and so this idea that there's these wedges, which is an old idea. I remember when Pakula's Wedges was first published and I was at the Carnegie Institute of Global Ecology at Stanford and we were all talking about it as this great innovation. But after seeing it play out all these decades from then, uh, it's become so clear that it just diffusing the solution space into everything that could possibly make a difference has meant that people do everything except for the hard stuff. And the hard stuff is transitioning off of fossil fuels and cheap, you know, carbon polluting energy. Uh, and that needs to be where the focus is exclusively. Otherwise, it's just going to be one more moral hazard after another, if you ask me. Um, let's see. I think that probably covers a lot of it. Just again, uh, Susan's point about, about uh, creating kind of co-constituencies, I do get that. That makes a lot of sense. And I think that's ultimately what's driving the well-intentioned efforts to bring trees into this rubric of solving climate change. I think that's like, there's a lot of people aren't doing this because they're morally corrupt. A lot of people are using this idea because they believe that it can help save forests. Uh, and I want to help save forests too. But I still feel forests already have their own constituencies and they can have more. They don't need this constituency to solve the problem. And if you bring in this idea that it is the big solution, you will get what we have now, which is a president who thinks it's somehow gonna solve climate change and is promoting that as the only, single only thing that he will do. And corporations like Exxon and Chevron and, and uh, BP, you know, that's what they're doing. They're actively engaged in it because it, it serves their purposes, at moral corruption again. Um, let's see. And just uh, Fernando's points, I'm, I'm all for the equity in infrastructure, uh, polycentric governance, but I feel like this, again, this diffusion of governance, like let's just everybody do something. 
has again diffused away from actually the solution, which is ultimately about a transition of the whole society off of this energy system. And it's just, it's really hard to do. It's been proven really hard to do politically uh, and economically. So without the focus, just being on that, everyone does the little stuff that doesn't actually make a difference in the long term. Um, let's see, anything else here? I think, uh, again, I, when dealing with, uh, with, with Matt's comments, which if you would ask, if I had discussed this thing 10 years ago, I would have been saying exactly what Matt says. It's, it's my experience over the years coming together that has changed my point of view. Uh, and, and just one last little piece of background before I, uh, you know, stop hogging the, the screen here. Uh, is, so I used to teach uh, global biogeochemical cycle. So I, I would teach, you know, the carbon cycle. And of course, the carbon cycle has plenty of, of carbon dioxide moving through the atmosphere, through the biosphere. So the idea of calling carbon, especially carbon dioxide, a pollutant, is a very strange idea for a scientist who studies this or teaches it, because it isn't. It's a natural thing, CO2. Plenty of CO2. It's going in and out of the atmosphere all the time. It's not unnatural. But it, after seeing an Obama's uh, administration's EPA did try to, to make carbon into a pollutant and to essentially be able to address uh, carbon dioxide as a pollutant in the Clean Air Act, which has real political power, which can lead to full regulation of carbon emissions and all that. And seeing that, that use of that term, you know, nobody's for pollution. Nobody is for pollution. Everyone's against pollution. Even people who make pollution are against it in principle. Uh, and so putting carbon in that category, not talking about the, the, the need for, you know, putting a, putting a knob of carbon here and pulling a knob of carbon there, that is not what we need to think about. We need to think about stopping pollution. And I think that's a simple political constituency uh, and the need for, of course, clean energy. Uh, those two things together are, are the, the levers that the, the foci that will drive forward the real solutions. And, I, and, and everything else that I've seen has been basically turned into a way of avoiding the, the, the ultimate solution here. All right, sorry for talking so long. No, that's great. Any rebuttals to the rebuttals? Well, I, I had a thought, um, which is, I was thinking about getting my daughter who's five years old to brush her teeth. Um, and sometimes it's a long drawn out negotiation process where, uh, I get her to enter, enter the bathroom. That's the first step, right? It's a half measure, right? It's not yet getting the toothpaste on the tube or the water turned on or any of that. But half measures get you halfway there. Even 10% measures get you 10% of the way there. Um, and I would say the issue of moral corruption is a really interesting one. I thought it was very well taken. And I think the first question you have to ask is in any compromise, you're going to be engaged with morally corrupt actors, right? Secondly, who is using whom? It's not like tree planting people don't know this is going on. I have a colleague who's a very well-known restoration ecologist who has an op-ed in science coming out soon called tree planting is not a panacea. So we're, we're trying to educate the public. I think the challenge is always is raising your voice, getting it heard. Um, but I think that every restoration ecologist I know working in restoration wants people to know that you should tr pl plant trees in the tropics. You should, focus on more diverse things than just monoculture tree plantations, but also recognizing that we shouldn't demonize tree plantations. And this, this is where we tend to argue with each other and where it gets drowned out. Um, but I mean, seriously, Trump is talking climate change solutions. Exxon is talking climate change solutions. That's not nothing. It's not something, it's not what we want, but it is part of a loaf. It's not a whole loaf, but it's part of a loaf. And it's amazing to me that but when the words trillion trees came out of Trump's mouth, I nearly fell out of my chair. Because that's, here we are, have an incredibly politically conservative person proposing a solution. Of course, they're proposing it as the solution, but you know, as things get worse, as the impacts become more and more apparent, as the success of building, as Susan pointed out, uh, building campaigns with us using these small measures, uh, as that becomes starts to become apparent, you're going to see more and more stuff slip in. That the, the foes of climate change will start to introduce more and more options. And finally, I would say that recycling uh, plastic lowers oil demand, right? Plastic is oil. So you can think about that as planting a tree in your yard lowers the urban heat island effect, lowers the need for burning coal to keep houses cool. So even though they've identified not the most effective steps, right? The fact of being a vegetarian would be a wonderfully effective step. They are, their students were identifying effective steps. I think if we bring them in 
with these things they're familiar with and they can see make a difference and introduce them to other things people can do. It builds that sort of community and excitement that Fernando pointed out, we need to build movements. And Eleanor Ostrom had the right idea. Governments won't step forward. We can't force governments to do what we want as individuals, right? We need to join together and start doing it ourselves. We can't, we can't wait. So tree planting is part of that sort of idea, that polycentric idea. Um, Sure, I definitely agree with Earl that the, the holy grail is clean energy, but I feel like we need to build up a tidal wave of support and tree planting is a big part of doing that because the side benefits are really large. There's a lot of them that we could be talking about, but I, I feel like Earl's already stipulated all those. We already agree tree planting is great. So why denigrate it? I, I have to jump back in. I'm sorry, Matt. I, I can't disagree with you more. I can't disagree <laughs> with you more on this. This is why okay. we're having this is fun. If the goal is getting your daughter to brush her teeth and getting her to brush half her teeth is getting you halfway there, fine. Planting trees doesn't stop any emissions of fossil fuels. None. Does it build any clean infrastructure for clean energy? None. It has no relationship with the solution. The only solution we need is to stop emitting fossil carbon pollution and to start using clean energy. That is the solution. Tree planting is a diversion. It, the way you made it sound, I mean, I'm not accusing you of moral hazard here or moral corruption at all. I think you have very good intentions. And the idea that like we should solve industrial carbon pollution by planting more trees in our yard is just, it's mis, it's, do not tell people this. This is, I'm serious. This is, this is miseducating people. And your job as a scientist is to actually translate the science into something that will produce better results. Now, politicians are supposed to really do this too, but as we know, there's politicians of all stripes, but the, the scientific message, I mean, ever since the first Kyoto negotiations, the Russians and the US government brought in forests. It was not originally the plan to have forests in there. They brought them in, moral corruption, absolutely, no question. It made it more agreeable because it would be less uh, work to get to the 1990 levels in the negotiations. That's why forests were brought in. They were a fig leaf for these big emitters. Now, Russia never had a problem after that because their economy collapsed, but the United States was never able to verify, or sorry, validate or, or join the Kyoto Protocol because of it just never slowed down its emissions. And this is the same thing. It's the, the, the idea that you can solve the problem in this way. When the problem is carbon pollution, and the lack of a clean energy system, you can't solve it with trees. Do not pretend that you can solve it with trees. I think the best estimates are it's three to 10%, right? And that's, we need to be fair and honest about that. It's 0% change in carbon pollution emissions and 0% change in energy infrastructure, zero. So we're really, we're all, I think, really happy just to listen to Earl and, and Matt debate. I mean, really be delighted. And if it gets reframed that way, just, let everybody know. Um, I think that would be fine. I, I do want to flag whether we, I mean, uh, of course, we need to get rid of carbon emissions. I think, I think that everyone would agree with that. Um, and after that, I just want to highlight a couple of points about how politics and governance work and people can like it or not like it. I understand everything about the media um, leads us to believe that the only kind of politics in the world is run by one person who's at the top of a hierarchy. And indeed the current president of the United States seems to believe that except when, um, when uh, the governor of New York reads the Federalist Papers to him. And I, I don't particularly mean to make partisan comments, but really truly this is a media coverage problem where we believe all of governance happens with one person. And while um, that, person is important and leadership certainly matters. We can like it, we can not like it. Um, there are multiple um, strands of governance um, in this country and everywhere. Even with regard to the pandemic, for example, some of the background conditions for making social distancing work well is um, a society where people trust each other. It's one of the reasons New Zealand is working fairly well on that. There, I mean, there are a lot of reasons. And it means that the fairness and equity that Fernando mentioned earlier is utterly crucial to build in all the way along. It's not a second priority, for example. And recognition that whether we like it or not, there are multiple efforts 
all the way throughout the country, and we need to build on those. And again, the, the, there is good evidence that giving people practical action, not giving people as though that's handed down from above, but people being able to find practical actions where they can see that they are taking one step to improve things could contribute to building the effort for getting rid of carbon emissions because clearly that's what has to happen. But we need pathways to doing that. And that doesn't come from one person at the top of a hierarchy decreeing that that's gonna happen. So we need to find ways. And if that includes the environmental equivalence of getting toothbrushing going in five-year-olds, by the way, I would not diminish the effort that that takes having raised one of those, but I now promise you, Matt, she's fully grown and texting me reports to read. Um, but, uh, but anyway, um, if we need to build the work required to get down carbon emissions, and if we're not only trusting an international viral catastrophe to get our carbon emissions down, if instead it's something else, then we need to build a constituency for doing that. And how do we get there? It's pretty clear. It's not only about telling people where they're wrong. It's pretty clear that when we tell everybody that they're wrong, including our students, that it's extremely politically deactivating. Once again, there's really good evidence for that. And when we tell people they don't know anything, it's one of the contributors, and again, decent evidence in this, including from psychology and political science, um, that it's deactivating and increases resentment. So finding ways instead that we can build on where people are right, um, and clearly that has to get towards decreasing carbon emissions. I hear no disagreements that we like the view um, in Fernando's background and that we want trees where they can live. We want grasslands and marshlands where they can live. Um, and we absolutely want to get carbon emissions down. How do we get there? And I'll stop. So that's great. Um, keeping in mind that we basically have about 15 minutes left, I'd love to just see very quickly if Blake or Fernando has anything short to add, and then we'll open it up um, to questions from the audience. And again, you can feel free to chat me, or you can, once we're, once we're there, just feel free to unmute yourself and ask. Uh, yeah, I wanted to to, to add. Um, you know, one I think one reason why I commented that I thought the op-ed was a little bit extreme um, is that I I do agree that there's there's clearly a, a place for trees, uh, not just in terms of our environmental uh, obligations and our environmental planning, but also in terms of our reactions to climate change. Um, and, you know, one way to respond to what I think is an incredibly morally corrupt argument that the tree, trees are the only solution, which all of us seem to disagree with, one way to respond to that is to say, uh, you know, you know, look, this is, this is a diversion from the fact that truly the solution is to stop carbon pollution. Um, and I think that we can all also agree with that, but it's sort of not the end of the story. I mean, the argument might get us, might get us um, out of the out of the sort of uh, grip of the morally corrupt um, pundit, but it doesn't get us a sort of full social and political um, sort of picture about what we ought to do that, like. Uh, uh, that takes into account all of the different levels of action across all of the different levels of governance. So I just kind of wanted to um, mention that as a reason why I think um, there was some uh, something a little bit of extreme about the argument. But then I also want to appreciate the fact that we can um, we can sort of uh, also focus on particular aspects of the climate change problem in different ways um, in, in public discussions. So there might, I don't know, but there might be reasons for thinking that we need like a different approach to stopping climate change pollution that's completely top down than um, other aspects of the 
a, a climate change solution, which might be more bottom up. We did get a, a great question in that I'll go ahead and pose to the panel. What do the panels think will or could happen to people's attitudes and actions? And then I would also add policies and regulations after COVID-19, especially amid, amid reports of clear air or water due to the pandemic's disruption of fossil fuel burning. As Churchill said, never let a good crisis go to waste. What do you all think? I think the political person should should uh, answer that. I was just going to say we haven't uh, heard from Fernando in a little while. Any chance you want to chime in? Otherwise, I'm happy to. But uh, uh, Fernando, any commentary on that? Sure. And honestly, I will echo the work of Mark Paul, who's been doing a lot of work around um, the Green New Deal. And I'm sure I will butcher his argument, but basically the steep decline in the price of oil uh, opens a huge opportunity for enacting policies to move away from it, basically. Uh, he will be issuing a report in the coming days uh, sort of expanding on that argument, uh, and I'm looking forward to to following it. So I encourage you all to follow Mark, Mark Paul's work. Uh, my personal opinion is that I think this is a really dangerous moment. I mean, one thing we're, we're tracking through some work that I do with the Union of Concerned Scientists is that, of course, the Trump administration's EPA has uh, taken incredible, uh, I guess, uh, authorities uh, to pretty much uh, remove a lot of uh, regulations in the name of crisis. So uh, crises go both ways, right? Um, so how do we organize to do this? Well, good news is uh, scientists are, are aware of this, right? And uh, the United of Concerned Scientists has a network, 25,000 scientists, uh, one of the largest networks of organized, engaged scholars. Uh, they usually put out calls to action. Usually about three to five percent people respond. Well, they just put out a recent call to action in response to all of these EPA regulations being suspended, and about five to seven percent of folks are engaged. But, I mean, we need a lot more, and there's a lot that we can do, right? So mobilizing our students. One thing we know is that uh, students are an increasingly disenfranchised sector of the electorate. Uh, they don't vote that much. Uh, our university president at UMBC has taken steps to support re voter registration efforts. We need to do more in terms of making sure that students are getting registered and, and, and making sure that they go out to vote. We know, for instance, that STEM students are less likely to vote. So, and, and of course, COVID will present huge challenges for the electoral process. We know now through a report by the Brennan Center that corona proofing the elections will cost about $2 billion. And we've only a portion at the federal level about 40, up 400 million. So as we're facing these huge budget shortfalls at the state and local level, we're also going to have to be picking up uh, the slack of the federal government, uh, which might be for them particularly opportune to ignore the political implications and the electoral implications of this uh, moment. So uh, we need to get engaged. We need to uh, demand fair and um, fair elections and to secure the integrity of the elections. And in many of these, uh, of course, uh, these elections will have policy implications, environmental policy implications, climate policy implications. And I'll end by saying that a lot of these uh, measures that are taken now during times of emergency are measures that make sense uh, for the foreseeable future. Things like expanding voting by mail, expanding voter registration, giving people an opportunity to fix their ballot when it comes back, re when it's rejected. Uh, one of the ways in which a lot of voters are suppressed, right? So uh, same thing with measures to decarcerate. We know that high transmission rates are huge in uh, jails. Uh, two weeks ago, the highest point of transmission was the Cook County Jail in Chicago. This week is a jail in Ohio. So uh, we can't just take measures to reduce the prison population to historic lows during this time of emergency. We need to make take measures that are permanent and that are not just emergency measures. That is a risk 
that we have right now uh, during the times of, during the times of COVID. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to so we're getting so many great questions via chat that I'm going to suggest that if you if you would like to ask your own question, just chat me and then I'll and then I'll call on you. Um, while I'm waiting, we had a question. Considering a bottom up approach to environmental action, how can we include underrepresented urban communities who may not have access to the great outdoors and to trees in the push to transition away from fossil fuels? Any thoughts from the panel on underrepresented communities? I actually used to do tree planting with the Nature Conservancy with um, groups of kids that were all getting meals at schools. Um, and it was probably one of the most heartwarming things I've ever done in my entire life. They would go into the woods and get scared at cracking a twig because they'd never encountered that feeling before. They'd very, like, I was like, you've never cracked a, 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 a tree before? Like a twig on the ground? They jumped three feet in the air and then we had a whole conversation about it. It was fascinating to me. And I think the hardest, um, Part of this is, is, yes, you can plant trees in cities. Um, that can be something. You can care for a local garden. Uh, walking around New York City, you can really see the variation on these tiny little patches of dirt on dense streets of people caring for them or not caring for them locally as a community. And one of the funnest things you'll see is like a little set of patches of dirt in front of a small elementary school in a poor neighborhood being just a beautiful little garden. So I say that it is possible to do that. Um, it, it more needs to be poured into that. And I think the Obamas really led the way on kind of bringing gardening as a sort of national way of feeding our children better and engaging them with the earth, which is even more important than engaging them with this abstract concept of the environment. Um, and I think we need to do more of that. I will add to that by saying that marginalized groups and disadvantaged populations have spoken. They have a voice. We need to elevate those voices. We need to support those voices. Uh, they have developed principles for democratic and inclusive organizing. They're called the Hamas Principles for Democratic and Ingl Inclusive Organizing. I've just shared a link to the Hamas Principles in our chat that you should have there. I'm also sharing a link to the Bali Principles for Climate Justice. So I'll answer th that question by saying, Folks have spoken, they have a voice, and they've developed principles that have been extremely effective at moving other big, what are called big green groups, at being more mindful of adopting a people-oriented approach at building people power and working with frontline communities that are the ones facing the consequences of this climate catastrophe. That's great. Um, I'm gonna ask another question specifically of Earl and then um, also Susan, and then we'll see if we have time for one more after that. Um, the question is, I haven't heard any reference to the international groups that have worked on this problem for decades and whether the solutions they've proposed would actually help us make progress. Um, we had an international agreement that the US has stepped away from, but that might have had the potential to make some progress if it were pursued aggressively. So do you all have thoughts like we can start with Earl do you have any thoughts on what the international landscape might look like well I, I did bring up the Kyoto Protocol before which was actually intended to become a system that would carry weight uh, legally uh, unlike the Paris Convention which really the Paris Agreement has no teeth uh, even if it were people were doing something with it even if they didn't it, it, it really doesn't make any difference uh, and, and so what I've basically watched in my career, watching you know, what's happened with climate change, uh, I've seen less and less effective international agreements that uh, no matter that you know, Paris is the first agreement where everyone at the table, all the international parties agreed to admit that global climate change is caused by people and fossil fuel emissions, uh, that's it. That's the only real advance there. Otherwise, it's just people agree to monitor and do X or Y, and nobody's actually doing it. So, no, I've not seen international agreements uh, as effective solutions so far. And I think part of the problem is this, uh, there's so many powerful stakeholders for cheap fossil fuel energy that uh, including, you know, everyone who wants to get uh, wealthy for the first time. That would include uh, the disadvantaged people of the world who, who don't have uh, access to cheap energy, uh, electricity and this sort of thing generated by, by the grid. Um, in those settings, those people are, you know, the idea that, you know, the only solution is going to be planting trees, you know, that's what they've gotten so far. Um, when in reality, what we need to be doing is investing in clean energy and, and helping 
uh, countries that need to develop develop clean energy. A lot of this, in, in fact, is, is due to patent law and this sort of thing. A lot of the technologies for clean energy are owned by uh, groups that, you know, can sit on it and, and, and profit from it rather than, you know, assisting others in, in developing this. Um, I'll, I'll stop there, but yeah, I, I, haven't, I haven't seen the, quote, international community uh, as a powerful force for solving this. Uh, it's raised a lot of attention and it, it serves a role, I'm not against it, but I haven't seen it uh, create effective change. Uh, we're know we're, oh, sorry, go ahead, Susan. I was gonna say, I, I'm, I certainly wanna let Fernando speak to this because he does work on global social movements. I just wanna flag that enforceability is often not the issue with in international agreements. I think, for example, on um, CEDAW, um, and on uh, for women and on um, international uh, uh, efforts to manage domestic violence or to lessen domestic violence, for example, that the bringing people together and negotiating the agreements and mobilizing for local translation is often we've learned what the big point of much of this is. Has it eliminated domestic violence? Not at all, but has um, have international agreements provided some leverage for um, domestic groups to try and press on better implementation of anti-domestic violence efforts? Yes, absolutely. And I'm going to stop there and let Fernando speak because really he has the expertise on international agreements and climate change. Uh, thank you, Susan. And this question is really tied with the question that we asked before, right? The, at least my answer uh, about indigenous groups, uh, underrepresented populations, marginalized groups. Uh, Paris was an important moment for them. Uh, during the negotiations, there were talks about including in the operative section of the text uh, recognition of the rights of indigenous peoples. It ended up being draft, which speaks to uh, Earl's misgivings with the agreement. It, it lacks the teeth we'd liked it to have. But it was an important moment. It was a turning point in terms of the in terms of the participation of civil society groups and particularly marginalized groups in these negotiations. Since Paris, we are now witnessing that civil society groups, and particularly indigenous groups, which by the way, uh, inhabit a large portion of the landmass that we're uh, talking about here, are now given access into some of these negotiations, which uh, was not the case in Paris. Uh, so not only are they giving access, it, Paris created a platform, an indigenous people's platform, where now we are able to include the knowledge, the traditional knowledge of indigenous peoples uh, in the process of adapting to climate change. Again, very limited, but it's a turning point in terms of the extent to which these international negotiating processes are evolving and including more folks in those processes. Do we have a long way to go? Absolutely. But particularly Thanks. I, th I think um, we are getting close to being out of time, but I'm going to ask um, Blake to just, as our philosopher, wrap this up with one minute about where can we go from here? How can we move the conversation forward? Well, from my, from my point of view, I think conversations like this are incredibly helpful in, in terms of moving conversations like in terms of just moving the conversation of what should we do about climate change really broadly forward because you can see by bringing together different disciplines all of the different levels of action that need to take place and uh, i think the more opportunities that we have to see things from each other's perspective um the better and i think especially given the fact that when the powers that be get together in a room uh, to talk about what to do about climate change. That room is saturated in various types of sort of private and domestic self-interest that percolates through the conversation and excludes really important, important points of view. And, I, and, and from my point of view, the challenge with the issue about whether or not trees are the final solution to climate change has to do with who's gonna take, who's gonna get a position, who, who's going to have an opportunity to have a place to speak um, 
in the discussion about what, what we do about climate change. And I, I think that one of my worries about responses to instances of moral corruption like that is that if we, if we answer with too strong of a position, we, we serve to silence a lot of other possibilities as well. So I think, yeah, sometimes people use the language of win-win in morally corrupt ways, but that doesn't mean that we can't figure out ways to, to come together to find win-win solutions in, in a morally corrupt set of circumstances without ourselves falling subject to the urges of moral corruption. And I think there's a lot of examples today about like how how we can go about having more nuanced conversations in public about this. Um, well, on the note of- I have to say one more thing. Yeah, one yeah, trillion please. trees yeah, later. Absolutely. One trillion trees yeah, later, yeah. you still won't have clean energy. You'll still be burning fossil fuels. So we both have to keep our eyes on the prize and also continue to bring folks together in the interdisciplinary collaborative policy forward um, politically active uh, strategies that our, our panelists have, have proposed. So I think this was fantastic. I learned a lot. I want to thank everyone. And just I, I to, want to thank you, Christine. That's why I wanted to break in. I wanted to say, you. Christine, thank you so much for organizing this. It was such a great conversation. My really pleasure. Enjoyed it all. My pleasure. I really appreciate everyone. This was Earl's idea originally, and I love the format of a debate just for everyone to have that passion about their topics is fantastic to see. Um, and we'll be uh, posting the recording. The live stream didn't work, but um, we'll be posting the recording on Facebook, on our YouTube channel, and also on our website, socialscience.umbc.edu, so you all can find it there. Thank you all again so much for participating, and thanks to the audience, and I'll go ahead and end the meeting. Take care, everybody. Bye. Take care.